I'd like to introduce our guest speaker today, John Apostolopoulos, who is the VP and CTO of Enterprise Networks. Welcome, John, and thanks so much for joining us today. Great, thank you, and thank you for your kind invitation for me to join you and present here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence for intent-based networking. Here's a quick outline of what I'm going to cover. First, I want to briefly overview what are some of the challenges that people face today in networking. Then talk about what is intent-based networking. I'm going to give really a high-level conceptual overview of it, and hopefully something that you'll be able to remember and you'll be able to tell others about. Then what, or why artificial intelligence? Why is it useful here? And what is AI? And then I'll talk about four examples about how AI plus IBM can enable significant improvements. I'll talk about intelligent automation, intelligent assurance, understanding what's on the network, as well as detecting threats in encrypted traffic. So with that, let's begin. First, let's do a quick little time travel to, to examine how networks have evolved over recent years. Um, so at once upon a time, a network used to look like this. There was a campus and branch, and it was connected to a mainframe or server. And then the network perimeters, as you can see here, it's pretty well contained. Kind of simple. Then what happens is we had uh, data centers, uh, people wanted to connect to the internet and also to SaaS services, as you see on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, we had people working from home who are connecting via PCs or laptops via VPN to the, to the network, okay? So get more sophisticated, but still relatively simple. Then we have IoT come about. As you see on the left-hand side here, we, we have a much more diverse set of devices. Not only laptops, but smartphones, tablets, wearables, surveillance cameras, and so forth. And what they're trying to talk to on the right-hand side is not only the data center, but also the public cloud, SaaS services, and the internet. In between, to help, to help facilitate this communication, we have the rise of software-defined WAN, as well as the cloud edge. Um, and this has gotten even more complicated because some of these devices, like you see here, the tablets and the wearables, instead of communicating through the campus and branch to the cloud, they will go directly to the cloud through cellular. And as you can guess, this leads to various security issues and so forth. So there have been massive changes in how networks have been uh, uh, um, uh, designed and operated in recent years. And so a lot of exciting things happening here. Let's look at some of the challenges our customers face. So I'm showing here three basic classes of challenges, shown by these three columns. On the top of each column is the challenge, and on the bottom is how uh, intent-based networking and artificial intelligence can help solve the challenge. So let's look at these three challenges. The first of all is digital acceleration. Essentially, there, as you know, everybody's using mobile, everybody's using cloud, and, and people are moving to use more and more IoT, Internet of Things. And there are about 1 million new devices coming online every hour. Now, that's really scary from a network operator point of view because they don't know what to do with all these devices. What are these devices? What do they do? Now, what IBM and AI can help here is it can help in terms of helping you identify what are the devices on the network. And once you know what the device is, you can identify how you should treat them. The second class of challenges is complexity. Today, people spend about $60 billion a year just on network operations, $60 billion per year. Now, why is it so expensive? Well, it's very expensive because most of those operations are done manually, about 95% done manually. In addition, because they're done manually, these operations are slow and also error-prone because we, we, have, we do typos, we do mistakes. So how, how can intent-based network and AI help? Well, of course, we want automation, but more than that, we want intelligent automation. We want to do automation that can optimize the operation of the network. In addition, we want to understand what's happening in the network, and we don't want a tsunami of data from the network. Instead, we want to be able to summarize what's happening and to get useful insights. In addition, we want to know, is the network operating the way it's intended? We call that assurance, and assurance is a very, very important property, and I'll talk more about it uh, later in this talk. The third key area is security. And as you know, um, the more and more security threats happening. Um, because of IoT, the attack surface is getting larger and larger. Uh, the very sophisticated attacks, sometimes government-backed and so forth, leading to very, very sophisticated attacks. 
IBM and AI can help in terms of faster detection of these attacks as well as remediation of them. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about IBM, I'm going to talk about AI, and I'll give some examples. For instance, I'll give an example in this middle column of intelligent automation and intelligent assurance, and I'll also an example on the left-hand side about how you can identify what's in the network, as well as an example on the right-hand side about how we can detect threats in encrypted traffic. So I'll cover four examples of expressing these challenges. But first, let's talk about what is intent-based networking. Now, this is our aspirational goal for intent-based networking. The idea is, what if? What if we could just state what we intend to do and the network could do the rest? That is, we don't have to go down into the details about the, the queue buffers and the quality of service and this, that, and the other thing. Instead, if we can just say, hey, John wants to talk with Monica, let's say, for a telemedicine session, and then the network automatically figures out what needs to be done to provide a great experience. That's our aspirational goal. Now, to be clear, this is a journey, but let me describe to you how we're going about this journey to achieve this goal. So this is my view of, uh, of intent-based networking. Um, and, and first of all, intent-based networking, it's not a Cisco term. This is an industry trend. Okay, the many companies working in intent-based networking. Uh, I believe Cisco is the leader in the world in intent-based networking. And you can view intent-based networking as the new modern architecture for networking. In this diagram, let me just grab what we have in this diagram. At the top is you have a person or, or a machine, computer, who has an intent. That is something they want to do. At the bottom is the physical and virtual infrastructure. This is the wireless APs and the switches and the routers and the compute and storage. And in between are these three conceptual functions of translation, activation, and assurance. Okay? So the way this works is that, first of all, let's say the person at the top, they have an intent. They have something they want to do. And they express that, and that intent then gets translated into the network policies and security policies that should be activated in the network. Let me give you an example of this, excuse me, of this sort of intent. Uh, um, here's an example of an intent and the associated translation. The intent is, I have a telemedicine session tomorrow, or, tomorrow at 10 a.m. with Monica. So this gets translated into a number of network and security policies. First of all, we want to create an HD video communication session end-to-end. -end. We want to prioritize it with end-to-end -end quality of service. We want to keep the communication safe with authentication and encryption. We also want to validate the performance. That is, during the session, we want to check to make sure that it's providing a high quality of experience. And if not, we want to detect that and we want to fix it automatically. And at the end, we want to turn down the connection. So as you can see here, this intent, which is a very simple intent that a human can understand, gets translated to a number of different network and security policies, which then are activated in the network. So here is a translation that takes the intent and translates it to network and security policies. These policies are then activated in the network. We call it activation instead of automation because basically all three of those boxes I've shown there, they all do automation. So if we call the blue box automation, it would be a little confusing because they all do automation. Second of all, we want to do more than automation. We want to do optimize automation. And that's why we thought to have a different term. Hence, we call it activation. Now, once uh, the networking security policies are activated on the network, the next thing we want to do is we want to check, is the network behaving as expected? Um, and that's where this feedback loop comes in. And this feedback loop is very powerful. What it does is it gathers data about the network operation, and then it checks to see, is it operating the way it should? If yes, it says a green light, everything's good. If no, it, it, it identifies as a problem, and it tries to identify what is the problem. And I'll go into some examples of, of how assurance works uh, shortly. But you can see here we have this feedback loop, and this feedback loop is really, really very valuable. Now, for those of you who want to learn more about how intent-based networking compares versus traditional networking, we have a Cisco white paper, which I co-authored, and you can just search for intent-based networking Cisco PDF, and then you'll find the PDF document online. So there's a lot of detail in the document. Um, now, um, what, what architectures uh, have we built with this? 
The first architecture we built with intent-based networking was in the data center with Cisco ACI. Then we built it in campus using Cisco DNA and also over the WAN with uh, Cisco Software Defined WAN. And right now what we're doing is also going across all three of these different domains to provide a single architecture that works across all three of them. Okay, this is the work that's in progress. So now why artificial intelligence and what is artificial intelligence? Well, let's take a step back. Um, essentially, we, we being humans, we need help, okay? We need help to get more work done. We need help to do things faster to, uh, and so forth. With the Industrial Revolution, where we built cars and steam engines and other machines, they helped liberate humans from, from, physical, from physical limitations. For instance, uh, they helped us go over uh, much far, travel farther distances or carry heavy loads and so forth. So that's what the Industrial Revolution did. Um, now, you know, with uh, the networking challenges I mentioned, we have issues here with scale. There's, the networks are getting hugely uh, um, complicated and immense. And it's not possible for a single person, a single human, to have all the knowledge of the network in their head or to be able to adapt quickly as, 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 as network changes occur. So the goal of, the, of what's happening now, the digital revolution, is to liberate humans from the limits on their mental capabilities. And that's where artificial intelligence comes in. And in particular, what we try to do is we try to, we try to leverage the huge and very diverse sets of data we have in the network, in the client devices and so forth, couple that with artificial intelligence to understand how the networks operate, to optimize that, so forth, and then to provide feedback to, to all of us, to humans, so we can understand what's happening, and then we can guide the network to do the right things. Okay. All right, that's why we need it. Now, what is artificial intelligence? Here's uh, some, what I hope is very simple descriptions of what artificial intelligence is. Um, AI is a field of study to make computers have human-like intelligence when performing a task. And note this task is usually a very specific task. It could be uh, speech recognition, translating speech to text. It could be playing chess. It could be playing the game Go so forth. Within artificial intelligence, the various subfields, I've identified three important subfields here that are relevant for networking. The first is natural language processing, which gives the computers the ability to interact with humans. This includes speech recognition, where a human can say something and then be translated to text, as well as natural language understanding, where that text can be translated into meaningful things that the computer can understand, from words to what those words mean. Another key area is machine learning. This gives computers the ability to learn from data without actually being programmed. Okay, that's really powerful, that's really important. Many of you are familiar with how now um, we have come up with great machine learning algorithms to, uh, to detect cats in videos, okay? Well, if you think about that, it's really hard to program in C or Python or something like that rules to go and identify a cat in a video. But by using machine learning, where we identify patterns in large numbers of images, we're able to identify, hey, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a horse, and so forth. So machine learning is incredibly powerful at learning patterns, and learning patterns which are often are very difficult or impossible for humans to actually program. And then there's also machine reasoning. This includes organizing domain-specific knowledge bases, and by domain-specific, I mean something like wireless networking, okay, Wi-Fi networking. And for Wi-Fi networking, we can have facts, we can have relationships for these facts, as well as rules for how they come together. And this knowledge base could be provided by human experts, by me and you, for instance. And now we've, once we've created this knowledge base, we also have a set of rules about how to manipulate this knowledge to help answer questions. Think about machine, learn, machine reasoning as kind of like expert systems from the 1980s and 1990s, uh, dramatically uh, improved um, uh, through the use of semantic modeling and other recent uh, technologies. Okay, so hopefully this gave you a quick overview of what AI is, as well as the three key subfields that are important for networking. And let's see how it comes into play for intent-based networking. So here, once again, is the diagram I showed for intent-based networking. And basically, AI comes into play in all three of these uh, key uh, functions. For instance, in the translation step, shown in green, it can take the intent 
and map it. Let's say a human uh, verbally describes the intent. It can do speech recognition to take the intent and map it to text and then do natural language processing to understand what that intent is. Then it can pass it to the activation step. And there we can do a variety of machine learning based optimization of the network, wireless optimization, path selection for WAN, and so forth. And then the assurance step, we can use various forms of machine learning and machine reasoning to detect, is there a problem? And if, if so, what is the root cause of the problem? And I'll give some specific examples of this uh, in the next few slides. Okay, so now let's look at four examples of how AI plus IBM enables significant improvements. And we'll first start off with automation. Now, we know the world's going wireless, right? We're all using wireless devices all the time. Um, we're all using Wi-Fi all the time. What we want to do is we want to have all our applications work really well over Wi-Fi. This includes speech. This includes video communication. This includes things like augmented reality virtual and virtual reality. It also includes things like interactive multi-user augmented reality. I give this example because for, for this to work, where you may be playing games, as you see it here on the, on the left-hand side, or you may be with, uh, actually both these pictures are example of games, but you can do it to do modeling or, or for medicine or so forth. If the multiple people use an augmented reality at the same time, that is a multi-user case, what you want is you want all of them to see the same thing at the same time. That means you need really low latency on the wireless links in order to be able to, to achieve this. Um, previously, this was not possible, but now with Wi-Fi 6, we, we are able to, to turn that uh, uh, dream into reality. So let me describe to you a little bit about Wi-Fi 6 in terms of the capabilities it provides, and then we'll see how we can apply AI to help uh, optimize it. Well, as you know, Wi-Fi 6 is the newest version of Wi-Fi. It's also known as IEEE 802.11ax. Uh, and it provides four key categories of uh, improvements versus prior versions of Wi-Fi. On the left-hand side here, you can see it provides much higher data rates. For example, it uses 1024 QAM, uh, so it can give up to 9.6 gigabits per second if you have eight spatial streams from a single AP. 9.6 gigabits per second for a single AP. Notice this is the theoretical limit, so in practice you have less, but still that's a humongous number for a single AP. Okay. The second key area is we can increase the overall network capacity. For instance, we can um, the throughput could be three to four times that achievable using prior versus prior 802.11 AC. Okay. And this is used in a new technology called orthogonal frequency division mobile access, which I'll describe in a couple of slides. The third key uh, benefit is we can uh, lead to um, much lower latency. And, and the reason we can do this is we're, we're now going to use scheduled uh, transmissions. Um, so we schedule both the downlink and the uplink using orthogonal frequency division mobile access. And as a result, it can provide much more deterministic type quality for the, for, for the communication. And finally, it can lead to improved power efficiency. So I'm going to go into two of these in more deep, detail, basically the second and third columns here. So first, let me talk about the scheduling. As you may know, prior versions of Wi-Fi, uh, in order to fairly share the spectrum, what they use is something, they use something called basically um, listen before talk. So you'd listen to see if somebody's using the channel. If not, then you try to transmit. Okay, and everybody uses the same technique. You can view this as a gentleman's type technique. Um, the problem with it though, is that as the number of users increase, the performance goes down. As an example here on the left-hand side, we show latency on the vertical axis versus the number of users. And what happens is as the number of users increases, the latency can dramatically increase. And that's bad. For things like voice, we want low latency. But the fact that as the increased number of users, latency can get really big, that's really bad. However, with Wi-Fi 6, because we can schedule when we transmit each and every packet, we can have latency that increases linearly with the number of users. So that's a huge win. Now let's look at data throughput. On the right-hand side, I show the aggregate throughput to all the devices in all the devices being serviced by a single AP. Um, what, what happens here is you can see as you increase the number of users for prior versions of Wi-Fi, the aggregate throughput would fall. 
Okay, that's really bad. That means as you go from 10 to 20 to 30 or 40 users, the total throughput that, that AP delivers drops with the number of users, which is really bad. However, by doing scheduling, you can keep the same aggregate throughput even as you increase the number of users. Okay, so that's a huge win. So what happens here is Wi-Fi, it's, both, it's a cost-effective and ubiquitous, and it will be ubiquitous solution, and it can also now provide service level, uh, various levels of service level agreements, in particular low latency and consistent uh, uh, throughput. Let's look at uh, how Wi-Fi 6 uses spectrum. What you've seen in this diagram is on the left-hand side is prior versions of Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 4 and 5, also known as 802.11n and 802.11ac, and they use a technique called orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, OFDM. Wi-Fi 6 on the right-hand side uses a technique called orthogonal frequency division multiple access with an A. That's why the A is in green, because <laughs> I wanted to distinguish these two. And let's see what these two types of techniques do. Well, prior versions of Wi-Fi, as you see on the left-hand side, at each time instant, they would use all the frequency to send a single, uh, to, to speak to a single user and often to send a single type of information. For example, this first time slot, they send just this blue information, this blue data. In the second time slot, this dark green data, the third time slot, the light green data, and so forth. So they talk to one user at a time. Now with OFDMA, what happens is at each time slot, we can split the frequency into subbands, and then we can transmit to multiple users at the same time. So on the right-hand side here with OFDMA in Wi-Fi 6, in the first time slot, we can transmit both to the light blue user and the light green user. In the second time slot, we can transmit to five users at the same time and the third time slot to two users, and so forth. So as you can see, you can transmit to many more users at the, at, in a given time slot, and therefore you can basically reduce the delay required to, to deliver all these packets to the users. So this is a huge improvement over prior versions of Wi-Fi. Okay, so why do I show this to you? I showed this to you for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think this is really cool. This is major new advances in technology that are very powerful. Second of all, what you see is that there are actually a lot of knobs here which we can turn to optimize the performance. But the question then is, how do you go about opt turning these knobs? Um, in particular, for given AP, we need to change the knobs, change what we're doing for the scheduling based on the number of devices here, what applications all the devices are using, what packets are in the packet queues for each device, on the uplink and the downlink, and so forth. So there's a huge amount of variability here. Solving this using conventional scheduling techniques is really hard. It's a combinatorial problem. But here we can use AI and especially machine learning to help optimize the scheduling to get us the performance benefits we want. Okay, so this is really cool stuff. Now let's look at assurance. Now, the goal of assurance, once again, is to verify that the network is operating the way that, that's intended. Now you may ask, why is this difficult? Well, this is difficult because let's say you have an, a, a mobile client here on the left-hand side, and it wants to communicate to an application on the server in the data center here on the right-hand side. Well, to go from this mobile device to the data center, you first have to go over the wireless link, then the access point, then the campus network, then the wireless controller perhaps, then the WAN link, then the data center network, and then you have various other um, uh, network services over here too. Basically, the many different places that a problem can occur, many different places. And it's hard to determine uh, where a problem is. Furthermore, often it's actually really hard to determine even is there a problem. So the goal of assurance is first of all to determine is there a problem? And if there is a problem, what is the problem? Where is the problem? And how can I quickly fix it? These are all natural questions, right? What is, is there a problem? What is the problem? Where is the problem? How can I quickly fix it? These are the questions we want to try to uh, solve with assurance. Now, you may ask, um, well, you may think, well, it's easy to know that there is a problem. I would say that's not really true. It's easy to know there is a problem if somebody calls up and complains that they have a problem. But at that point, 
uh, there's been already a problem and it has frustrated somebody to the extent that they wanted to communicate um, and to, to let you know there's a problem. Ideally, you'd proactively be able to determine that a problem, that there was a problem before it, before it uh, impacted any users or, infect, or uh, affected their um, productivity. Also, there are cases where it's not quite, it's hard to determine if there's a problem. Let's say with my wireless device, it takes me 100 milliseconds to associate. Is that good? Is that bad? How do you know if for your network and for the people around here also trying to use the wireless network that, that this time is actually good or bad? It, it's hard to know uh, in general. And so you want to have a more um, uh, sophisticated way, accurate way to figure out, hey, is this operating as intended or is there a problem? So first of all, let's look at how can we go about figuring out is there a problem? And the way this is typically done is by something called uh, baselining. Uh, the idea of baselining, a baseline is basically what is the normal operation from a network, of a network. And if you know what the baseline is, then you can check to see, hey, is the network uh, performing abnormally? If it is, then that may be a problem. If not, then it's, it's just performing normally. The typical way of doing baselining and for looking for anomalies is the following. For any parameter of interest, let's say the association time that I mentioned before, you may have some range of the value that makes sense. Let's say some min and some minimum, some maximum range, maximum value. And as long as the parameter, so view this as a time axis horizontally, um, and as long as the parameter is within the min and max, everything you assume to be good, as shown in green here. But if it's outside the min or max, then you assume that an anomaly has occurred and you raise an alert, okay? This is typically what's done. Now, the number of problems with this, first of all, how do you choose the min and max? And as the number of users, let's say, in the wireless network changes, should this min and max change just because there are more people there? The network could be operating fine, but it may just take a little extra time because there may be 30 people connected here instead of 10, okay? That's one aspect. Another thing is that every time an anomaly is raised, it gets somebody's attention. It, you know, every time an anomaly occurs, lead into an alert, you get somebody's attention. And if these alerts are actually not problems, that is, if they're false positives, the false alerts, um, what happens is that the, the operator who receives these alerts gets really frustrated because they get all these alerts which are not, which do not correspond to problems, and they start ignoring all the alerts. And that's terrible because the system then becomes worthless if the operator ignores all the information from the system. So these false positives, these false alerts are really, really bad, and we want to minimize them. So what we've done with AI is, is what we call dynamic baselining here. Basically, it's very customized uh, baselining for your network as a function of the time of day and the number of users on the network and what they're doing and so forth. We have a much more sophisticated way to, to identify, hey, is this an anomaly or not? And as a result, we can do a much better job uh, uh, identifying relevant anomalies and having fewer false positives. <clears throat> Here's a concrete example we've done with some customers. Uh, to sh and this example shows, well, this is some data that shows how AI can dramatically reduce the false positives. So these are issues uh, generated uh, for our 11 customers over a three month period. And using conventional statistical methods, there are about 8,000 issues generated for those 11 customers over that three month period. Now using uh, some correlated analytics type techniques, we've reduced it by a factor of seven from 8,000 to about 1,192. And then by using this uh, machine learning, which I just described, this dynamic baseline, we reduced it to 303. That is an additional 75% reduction in alerts. So what happens here now as a result is the many fewer alerts, so that it doesn't, uh, um, and these alerts are really focused on the relevant issues versus the false positives. Um, and also we can categorize these alerts in terms of these are the most important and these are lesser important to guide the operator in terms of how they should prioritize looking at these various problems. Okay, so these are some of the results that can be achieved. So Cisco um, Assurance um, essentially works in the following way. We gather a huge amount of telemetry data to get a rich contextual understanding of what's happening. You can see a lot of the data here on the left-hand side. 
Okay. With this data, we do complex event processing, you know, correlation across the data streams and so forth to get us to get us information about um, is the network operating the way it should? Are the anomalies? Uh, other insights in terms of the operation and so forth. And if there are problems, uh, to provide remediation, to guide the user in terms of how to remediate or how to fix the problem. One of the key things I want to leave you with is that assurance is a very new capability and the huge opportunities for applied machine learning and machine reasoning to do this troubleshooting. So this is something we believe will be really very valuable for our, our customers. As a concrete example of this, this is for a customer that's um, pretty close to San Jose here. They have about their university with about 25,000 students, and they had a problem with Wi-Fi onboarding. That is getting the students had a problem getting their wireless devices on the network. Now, the reason this problem was difficult is that only some of the students were sometimes having a problem. OK, and the fact that it's some of the students sometimes it makes it hard to the problem's not repeatable very easily, and as a result of that, it's hard to debug. Fortunately, they had Cisco uh, uh, Assurance, and they basically ran the, uh, uh, the algorithms and stuff, and they found out the following. There's only a subset of the students that ever had the problem. They had the problem when connected to a subset of the APs. These APs um, were connected to a single wireless controller. That wireless controller had its software updated the night before, the software was fine, um, um, and the certificate was fine, but the certificate on the software was out of date relative to the that on the devices. I mean, the, on the devices were out of date relative to the, the software. Okay, so what they had to do is update the certificates on the mobile devices, and everything was fixed. All right, why did I go through these these various steps here? The reason I, I showed that is that often there are many steps from the observed data, the observed problem, to the root cause. And it can take a network expert like you or me hours or days to try to go through and figure it out. Um, with Cisco's Network Assurance, they, they were able to identify the problem within five minutes. So this shows the huge advantages you can have in terms of visibility of what's happening in the network, troubleshooting, and so forth. Um, uh, as a quick note, uh, our um, um, AI Network Analytics, this was announced at Cisco Live US. Um, um, it's available now. There's all kinds of training data, uh, training information available online. I'll talk about some of it at the end of my talk. It can provide you the improved visibility, uh, improved insights in terms of what's happening, as well as the ability to take actions. If you identify a, root, uh, a problem, take actions in terms of how to fix the problem. So there's a lot of information available here, and I highly recommend for those interested to learn more about this. Now let me look at the third example. Understanding what's on the network. Um, what happens after you think about this question, you realize this is actually really important, but we don't normally think about this question. We don't normally think about what's on the network. But it's, it is really important to, to be able to understand what's on your network. By what I mean, what devices, what users, what applications, what things, IoT things, and so forth. Because if you know what's on the network, then you can decide how the, net, how the network should treat it. Some examples we can, uh, of the benefits we can get are the following. First of all, we can provide improved performance. If you identify that the voice over IP phones in the network, you can actually treat the voice over IP with low latency. Similarly, if you have augmented reality headsets on the network, you can treat those with low latency. Another key area is separating environments um, and limited access. Um, for instance, you may have some HR databases, and only the, the human resource employees should be able to interact with the human resource or HR databases. Nobody else should see that data because it's private data. Another example in hospitals, you want the hospital medical devices to be separate from the guests guest network. Okay, that's obvious. But you also want those devices to be separated maybe from each other and separated from the printers and the computers that the employees can use too. So there are a lot of opportunities here to protect people, devices, and data. And I want to talk about this a little bit more because of the importance of, uh, of cybersecurity nowadays. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of the NotPetya um, cyber attack. 
This occurred in the summer of 2017. Um, and it's probably still the most devastating cyber attack uh, in history. Basically what happened here is that a virus was placed on some software, uh, some tax software, and, ba and essentially each of the companies doing um, business in the Ukraine probably had one computer which had this tax software on it, and then they had the bug on one computer, but that, that virus then hopped from that computer to all the other computers in the same LAN, across the, the, all the computers in the building, in the campus, in the country, and then globally. Okay, so many big companies, including Merck, the pharmaceutical, Maersk, the international uh, uh, container transport company, uh, Cadbury Chocolates, and many others were impacted by this, and many of them lost hundreds of millions of dollars, had hundreds of millions of dollars in damage in hours. Okay, um, this goes, this article, it's a very long article actually, it's a very scary article. I highly recommend for those interested to, to read it. It's in Wired Magazine, uh, August uh, 22nd, 2018, and it describes this uh, cyber attack and what happened. And the reason the cyber attack was so destructive was that the malware was able to spread easily. It started out on just one computer, but it was able to spread laterally across many, many different computers very, very quickly. However, if you had network segmentation, if you, if you had segmentation applied, you'd be able to dramatically reduce the problem. Then in, in the Wired magazine, they say themselves here that if, if the, if the uh, companies which were impacted actually had segmentation, their, the damages would be much, much less. But to have segmentation, you need to know what's on the network in order to be able to do the segmentation, okay? My key point here is you have to understand what's on the network to be able to do the network segmentation to protect yourself. Okay. So how do we go about figuring out what's on the network? This is a simple example. This was published in IEEE Infocom in 2017 by some colleagues in, um, in academia in Australia. And I love this example because it's very pictorial. And it's also one of the first examples of identifying IoT devices in a building, such as the building I am in, or, or you may be also. And what you see here on the top, there are about 25 columns, and each one of those columns corresponds to a different IoT device. We have hubs, such as Amazon Echo, cameras, such as drop cams, various switches, uh, such as uh, uh, motion detection uh, switch, <clears throat> air quality sensors, healthcare devices, light bulbs, which are IP connected, electronics, such as printers, as well as laptops and smartphones, because we have those on a network too. So you see here 25 different types of devices. And the rows here, these are about a dozen different um, network attributes. And what they did is they looked at these network attributes, let's say sleep time, or the amount of volume of traffic transmitted, or average packet size, and so forth. And they try to use these to identify what was the different device. Notice they didn't look at the payloads of the packets. They just look at these higher level attributes. Okay. And what you see here is they, they, uh, they bait, for each one of these attributes, let's say sleep time, they, they took the range and split it into five different, uh, uh, bins, five different amounts from one to five, and they color coded them. So, uh, one is purple, two is blue, three is green, four is tan, and five is red. Okay. Now, the reason I like this figure is if you look at the column, let's say for the Amazon Echo here or so forth, you see a color pattern. That color pattern is basically the signature of the device, the fingerprint of the device. So when you see this color pattern, that's what allows you to determine it's this device. Furthermore, if you look across all the columns, you'll see all these columns, their color fingerprints, their color patterns are different. That's what allows us to distinguish between the different sorts of devices accurately. Okay. So this is a simplistic example because there are only 25 different types of devices here. But the same, exam the same concept applies more broadly when we have hundreds or thousands of devices we're trying to classify. Okay. Now to um, understand what's, um, what's on your network, machine learning is really key. <clears throat> the general approach looks like this. First of all, we identify what devices and apps are on the network. 
Okay, using the, the example I just described to you, using uh, that machine learning type classification. Then we use intent-based networking to separate these different devices into different network segments. Then we'll apply best practices to optimize the performance of these devices. You know, for connected light bulbs, we want to treat them differently than for augmented reality headsets. And then we want to perform behavioral analytics to check to make sure the devices are behaving the way they should be. Okay. For example, a device may behave in differently because it may, be, it may begin to malfunction or may be compromised. In either of these cases, we want to raise an alert. And as you can see here, steps one, three, and four all use machine learning to perform these functions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now we talk about the fourth and final example, identifying malware and encrypted traffic. So we know malware has been a big, is one of the big uh, security threats we have. And historically, the, tr the typical way we've gone about identifying and stopping malware is the following. When we have unencrypted traffic, we basically, once we identify a type of malware, we'd look for the fingerprint of the malware. We generate a fingerprint for it. And then as we have traffic coming through a network, we'd have a node in the network that look all the traffic, Try to see if the traffic exhibits that fingerprint. If it is, that shows that there's malware and you stop it. And if not, we let it pass through. So this is how we identify malware in unencrypted traffic. Now, um, as you know, there's been a big move toward end-to-end -to -end encryption. End-to-end -end encryption is really good. You all should be using it, okay? That helps protect your privacy, protects your identity, pre prevents people from stealing your credit card information, so forth. It's really good. You should use it. The problem with end-to-end -end encryption, though, is that bad guys could use the end-to-end -end encryption to hide malware in the encrypted flow. So the, the way to try to identify malware when we have encrypted traffic is the following. We have a node in the middle of the network. We give it the keys for the decry to decrypt the content, and then we decrypt the content, <clears throat> then look for the malware using the same approach I described before, you know, using the malware signature on the unencrypted content, and then re-encrypt it to send it forward. Okay, so this is how we identify malware in encrypted traffic, uh, uh, and it basically involves giving it the key and using decryption. Now, this approach is really bad for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, we're breaking the privacy here. Okay, that's, that's bad. Second of all, we have to distribute the keys. That can lead to a security issue. Third is we decrypt in the contents. The content is available in plain text. Somebody else can steal it then. And fourth, there are complexity issues here. There's a lot of uh, computational costs for decryption and re-encryption. Okay, so there are many reasons this approach is bad. So what happened was about five years ago, uh, Dave McGrew, who was a Cisco fellow, he, came, he thought, hey, this is a really bad approach. Is there another way to solve this problem? For example, can we identify malware in encrypted traffic without requiring decryption of the traffic? That's the problem he posed, and turns out we can solve it. And let me stress once again what happens here. In this case, we have encrypted traffic coming through, and we want to identify whether or not there's malware without requiring decryption. That is, without giving it the key without giving the node in the middle of the network the key to decrypt the content, okay? I'm just gonna spend a couple minutes to give you a high level view of how this works. Because this, at first it sounds like magic, and it, it is a little bit, it's, it's pretty elegant work. Turns out this problem, identifying malware and encrypted traffic, it corresponds to a supervised machine learning problem. And essentially it works the following way. We have a huge amount of information about known benign traffic, that is good traffic, as well as a huge amount of information about known malware traffic. Given these two types of traffic, we try to identify observable features which can, which can be used to detect whether or not a particular traffic is malware or benign. Okay. Let me give you an idea about some of these features that are used. So the top row here shows malware traffic. The bottom row says, shows benign traffic or, or good traffic. And the, the different columns here show different types of information we have access to. So first is TCP IP data. 
Well, if the IP address is on a watch list, obviously that's to suggest that they may be malware here or something bad may happen, okay? Also for DNS, if the DNS looks like that over here, that, there's this funny um, thing that you can't understand. Well, that, that may also have raised alerts. If it's just cisco.com or yahoo.com or google.com, then that's probably benign traffic. Similarly for TLS, if it has an unusual fingerprint or unusual certificate, that may once again suggest that there's malware. If it's more a more typical fingerprint, typical certificate, then it's probably okay. And then this fourth column is what we call the sequence of packet lengths and times, SPLT. This shows the, the bi-directional uh, flow of traffic from the source to the destination, including the timings and the packet sizes. And it turns out that various sorts of actions, let's say a Google search, as you see on the bottom, versus malware, as you see on the top, have very different patterns. And that is incredibly useful to help us to identify a malware versus benign traffic. For those of you who are interested in learning more, there's a lot of uh, published papers on this topic. Uh, in addition, we have um, some of the source code to do the, the packet analysis We've provided it, uh, uh, Dave McGrew and colleagues have made it available on GitHub. And also even the fingerprints for the malware is also, we, we up, it's publicly available and we update them weekly. So there's a lot of information available here for those who want to learn more. Okay, so I've just described the four examples. So let me just summarize here by saying it's a really exciting time in networking. Intent-based networking can dramatically improve performance, agility to change the network, the security, as well as the reliability of the network. And then coupling artificial intelligence and IBM can enable significant improvements. And often these may appear magical, especially at first. You may, you may think that it's not possible to solve a problem, but by applying various sorts of AI, we can come up with a really cool and uh, elegant solution. For those of you who want additional resources, I've listed some resources here. I haven't given you the web links just because the web links are really long, but it turns out if you do a search with your favorite uh, 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 browser, let's say Google or so forth, these are easy to find. For instance, there's a white paper on IBN, which uh, I co-wrote, and if you search the internet for Cisco IBN PDF, you'll find it nice and easy. The number of blogs, which I wrote, and if you search for my name and blogs, you'll be able to find them. Um, we also have an intent-based networking website that has a huge amount. So I can't help you with that at the moment. I said Google and my phone started talking. <laughs> so uh, we also have an intent-based networking website. Uh, so just search for Cisco IBN, as well as an AI for networking primer available, which is quite good. And in addition, some of my colleagues just finished a multi-month uh, report on uh, global networking trends, which has a huge amount of data about where um, um, uh, 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 basically different use cases customer has, the challenges they have, the job opportunities they're, they're looking for in the future and so forth. There's a lot of very, very useful information there. It's hard for me to summarize it. There's a huge amount of useful information. It's available in PDF and other forums. And I highly encourage you to, uh, to, look, to go get it if you're interested. And, with, and that concludes my, uh, my brief presentation, and I'm happy to have any questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, John. You actually stole my thunder at the end because I was madly writing down these additional resources that you were, you know, mentioning throughout the talk, and there was just one extra that wasn't listed, which was that cyber attack, which was featured on Wired on the 22nd of August 2018. So just a reminder for the audience to go and look that up. So thanks, John. That was really, really informative and a lot of information, um, some great information and uh, very valuable for our students. So I'm going to cross over to our Q&A now. And I do know that we've got a couple coming in on the social media feed. But in addition, we've got um, our Singapore office and they've got one question for you. So I'm going to cross over to Singapore first. Hello, Singapore. Are you there? Yes. Hi, Emma. Hi, John. Hi. You um, had a question? Yes. Hi, John. Um, the question is, uh, does one need to be an expert um, at AI, artificial intelligence, or machine learning to apply them successfully to IBN? 
Um, awesome question. Um, no, you do not. What's especially important is to be a domain expert, to be an expert at networking, for example. And then these various forms of, of AI correspond to additional tools which can help you get your job done. Now, it's really important for you to be an expert at networking because if you're an expert at networking, you can see the information that you get from the AI algorithm and you can be able to tell, does it make sense? Because that's really important, right? So being an expert in networking is most important. Uh, second of all, it's useful to be comfortable with AI, to understand what it is, to understand the various sorts of techniques. Um, and some of you may become very passionate and go deep in it. Others may want to just use it as a tool in your toolbox. Um, and, and that can work great, too. And That's the network, right. AI for Network Primer, gives more information about, about these topics. Awesome. Sorry, John, I thought you'd finished then. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we've got another one just on the piggybacking on the back of that. Which IBM um, uh, capability is more important and why? Is it translation, activation, or assurance? Awesome question. They're all important uh, and important for different ways. Um, right now, you can actually operate a network just using activation and uh, assurance and have a human actually um, enter the, the, the intent without the translation step. Uh, you can have a human, for example, describe from a network point of view and from a security point of view what policies you want to do. This is what you do today. So you can just do that today, so you don't need the, tra the translation step. Um, I like assurance because what assurance does is it provides you a lot of visibility in terms of what's happening in the network. And that's immensely powerful. For many years, we've wanted to have visibility across the network, but we just haven't had that. We haven't had that because a lot of different nodes, they provide different sort of telemetry, getting a real-time un holistic understanding of what's happening across the network has not been possible. Today, we can get that with assurance, and we can also get uh, the ability to troubleshoot, to identify problems, and then troubleshoot problems, and that can save you an immense amount of time. Today, often when a problem may come up, it could take you hours or days to, to go through and get data from this network element from here, 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 to try to diagnose the problem. With assurance, you can get all that data very quickly, identify what the problem is, what the fix is, decide whether or not to implement that fix. And then you go on to do something more valuable, act beyond troubleshoot. Fantastic. So I think assurance is really valuable. Perfect. Um, I do have a question of social. Um, you know, is it expensive to implement the new way of networking um, and, you know, bringing in these new technologies? A great question. What happens is for different, uh, you, um, for each of you, there are probably different use cases you're trying to solve. It's, a, it's valuable for you to figure out, for your use case, where are the places you can have the biggest benefit, okay? So you don't want to do necessarily a tent-based networking for your entire network at once. You want to start off with identifying where are the places that can provide the biggest benefit, because that's most important for your business or whatever you're trying to do, and then do it there first, okay? Do it in a limited scope in the places that give you the biggest benefit, and then expand beyond that as needed as it's valuable for you. That's a way Fantastic. to help get the maximum benefit while minimizing the cost. Fantastic. Great advice. Thank you, John. And we've got a one, another one just come in. Why are we going to SD-WAN and what are the advantages? Oh, okay. So uh, software-defined WAN is similar to SDN, but it's for the WAN. Uh, normally what happens when you, when you use the WAN today is that paths are often uh, chosen statically. Um, with software-defined WAN, what happens is you can have multiple paths available to you. You can have MPLS, uh, you can have an internet-type best effort connection, you can also have a 4G LT connection, and SD-WAN can figure out which is the best path to use for what application over t as a function of time, and do that automatically. This can help reduce your costs, let's say for MPLS and so forth, as well as improve the reliability and performance of the network. So SD-WAN is something that has uh, really taken off over the last year, year and a half. Um, and, and over the next year, we see a huge number of customers going to adopt SD-WAN because the benefits that it can provide are really profound in terms of performance, reliability, as well as financial benefits reduced costs. Good one. Okay, they're all coming in 
Um, <laughs> a lot of questions now, John. Uh, a quick one that's just come in. Cisco provides, d does Cisco provide any training programs or certifications on IBN? Uh, yes. So what happens is uh, um, IBN includes things like automation um, and so forth. And Cisco provides a number of different uh, uh, um, conventional CCIE and DevNet uh, uh, type certifications, which are becoming available very soon. Um, which you can help learn the foundational pieces to build intent-based networks. Thank you. We've also got a new version of CCNA 7 coming out, which is really focusing on artificial intelligence and machine learning. So another good course to do there. Um, okay. Uh, can AI solve all of our networking problems? Huh. No. Um, AI can help hugely, but AI cannot solve everything. Um, um, you always need creative people to figure out, hey, what do we want to accomplish? How should we design our network? And AI can help with the optimization. It can help identify if there's a problem. It can help identify root cause of the problem. But then you want to be able to look at that data and see, yes. So, for example, the way we design our systems is we provide, uh, let's say, the network operator the information. Hey, we, we see this problem here. Um, this is what we believe is the root cause. This is the data we have observed which suggests that we have a problem and that this is the root cause. And this is the recommended fix. And then you can decide based on this data if you want to apply the recommended fix. And if so, it can be automatically initiated. It, uh, or if not, you can do something else. Um, but a AI is immensely valuable, but AI doesn't solve all the problems. Okay, well, I think that's all we have time for, John. I just want to thank you very much uh, for running us through intent-based networking, um, and thank you for your time. I know it's late over there, so we really, really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. It's my, my pleasure. Awesome. Thanks a Take lot. Care there. Uh, thank you. Bye, John.